Thanks. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to a Ceramic Community Call. Um, so today uh, we have a few updates from uh, the, the Freebox Labs team on uh, ceramic developments and uh, generally some, some interesting stuff we've been working on. And then, of course, uh, we'd love to hear from you guys uh, what you've been up to. Um, so yeah, I think uh, what I wanted to do actually um, was to, be, before we start, just kind of set up an agenda. So uh, I think I think I have some stuff from the Streetworks Labs team, uh, but I would love if like, um, if Cody, Graven, or Christian, you have some topic you would like to discuss, like we, we put that on uh, the agenda. Well, as most of you guys by know, right now I'm a real Nazi about words <laughs> and semantics and normal language. So um, I keep picking up people who can be instrumental in creating a taxonomy that we can use across all these different projects that I'm involved with. The ultimate goal being that um, when people sit down and write the problem statement, they, they have the right taxonomy available to them. Oh, okay, thank you. Right. Oh. Do you like? Do you have any topic for this meeting that you would like to discuss? I, I know we've been you've been like talking about <laughs> this exact topic for a while, but I mean, if right, there's right. anything specific you you want to bring up for the community call that's relevant to ceramic now, uh, then we think we'll add that to the agenda and we can talk about it. Um, no, I mean we can jump in along the lines of where we are at right now and see where we go from here. Okay, that's not a very clear agenda item. Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a technologist. Well, I am a technologist, but for me, I'm, a, I'm more like a systems architect uh, on a very high level. Okay. Um, Cody or Graven, any, any, any topics you would like to add to the agenda? Uh, yeah, if we can talk about the peer list a little bit, uh, I think that would be good if there's time. Yep. That's the main thing I had on Craven. I don't know if you had anything other as specific. No, I think that's a good capstone because I mean you were working and I think we're on the peer list now. So uh, talking through all that and I go forward. Be good. Yeah, cool. cool. All right. So um, maybe maybe Spencer, you want to kick us off with like an update on kind of what, what's been going on in, in the kind of core JS ceramic uh, land? Yeah, so um, lot basically everything right now is aiming towards mainnet launch. Uh, so a lot of work happening on our infrastructure side to like get our community nodes uh, ready to go for that, as well as some work on the core protocol, uh, just sort of battening down the hatches, uh, big, uh, set of effort is going on right now on cleaning up JS Ceramic um, in terms of how it maintains the state of documents so that it's possible to have a large number of documents pinned without all of those documents having to be in memory all the time. Um, so this is going to be really important once we have, you know, a live network with, with a lot more traffic, you could have hundreds or thousands of, do of pinned documents that ceramic will maintain the state for effectively without having to have a 10,000 documents in memory all the time. It's, they only get pulled into memory as you're operating on them, uh, but they can be, they can be, the state can be written to disk and taken out of memory without, without losing it. Um, so that's a big refactoring effort that sort of touches across the whole code base that we're working on right now. Um, we did another thing recently to allow right now the main way ceramic uh, up until recently has stored the state for pinned documents has been in a local level DB instance, um, just writing it to, to a little on, on the file system. Uh, that is still supported and that's still what we do by default, but we've also added support to store document state on S3, uh, which is what we'll be doing for our hosted community nodes so that we get better, you know, that'll be part of our backup 
uh, data recovery strategy, uh, you know, because S3 has good, um, you know, checkpointing and, and restore functionality to make sure that we don't ever lose any of the, the state that we're keeping. But this is something that anyone else running, running their own nodes could utilize as well if they want to ensure that the documents that their node is pinning, uh, rather than just keeping all that pinned state on the file system of the local node, you could also write it to S3 now. Um, so that's a new feature that just landed. Um, and that's, I think, the main things on the core protocol side. I also was prepared to talk a little bit. We made a change to the anchor service uh, so that when when the we have an anchor service that, that bought batches up multiple updates to, to documents, to different documents, into a Merkle tree and then puts the, the Merkle root on chain. And that's how we get the sort of anchor commits with the anchor proofs that show every time there's a change to a document that that update gets gets put on chain. So we have the, the, the history and the timestamp as to when it was updated and proof of publication and that kind of stuff. Um, we just made a change to uh, add some metadata to that Merkle tree that gets put on chain. Uh, including a bloom filter with a bunch of different properties about the documents that were updated. So I can share a little bit more about that. Um, is there anything else on core protocol stuff that I'm missing before I share that? Should I just share my screen on, and share the CIP on that? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Um, oh boy, I have too many browsers open, too many windows open. Uh, is this the one? I think this is the right one. Hopefully I'm sharing the right thing. Yeah, batch anchor data structure. So um, let's see. So this is basically a description of what just went in. And it's a slightly out of date on a couple of small details that I will be updating later today, but it, it gets the core idea. Um, basically, this is sort of the interesting part. So this is the Merkle tree uh, that contains. So each of these, if you ignore the thing on the right, like the third thing on the right, the tree metadata, the, the, the stuff on the left is what we've had up until now, which is basically just a Merkle tree of all of the updates to any documents um, that have happened recently. Uh, the thing that we've added is this new little, from the very top level root Merkle node, where generally most of the, the nodes in the tree just have two pointers to the, you know, the left half and the right half of the tree, that the root node gets an extra third pointer to a metadata object, uh, which is stored in IPFS. And that metadata object looks like this. It's got the number of entries in the in the tree. So this is just like how many documents were created or updated in this anchor batch. And then the bloom filter. And the bloom filter has information so you can determine, this is basically to enable indexing services. So if you wanted to, if you were working with the graph or any other indexing service, that wants to, to build an index over all the ceramic documents uh, and keep it up to date as things change, you could use this Bloom filter to know, okay, these are the, in the last X amount of time, we've had updates to these families, schemas, documents with this family, documents with the schema, documents with certain set of controllers, um, doc ID and also, uh, oh, sorry, with these family schema controllers, doc ID and tags are the, are the five things that uh, we put in the Bloom filter. So basically you can have an indexer that says, I want to index all documents with the family, with this family, right? It's so like your app might, for instance, have a family that all of the app specific data gets put with this family or with a specific tag. And then you could run uh, or pay someone to run a graph, subgraph indexing node to index all of the, the data. Spencer, your audio cut out. Still gone. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, you're yes. back. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe I'll turn my video off while I'm sharing and see if that helps. Um, how long was I out? <laughs> I think you, the um, last thing you said was something about subgraph. 
Right. So like if you were having an app um, that uses a certain set of tags or, or family to group your app related data, you could have a subgraph, you know, either run a, a subgraph indexing node or pay someone to run a node, a set of nodes to index, um, to index all of the documents with a set of tags or with a certain family, or you might care about indexing all the documents that have a certain schema or all the documents created by a certain user um, or all the updates to a specific doc ID. Um, you could index that. And now if you, to, to maintain that index, you could every time you could be monitoring state on chain and looking for when these Merkle trees get, get put on train, you can load the metadata for the tree and use the bloom filter to say like, okay, were there any updates to the doc ID that I care about in this batch? Were there any updates to any documents with the schema that I care about or the tags that I care about? Uh, yes or no. And if the answer is yes, then you actually can go through the, through the whole tree. You know, then it's worth the effort to go through the whole tree and find uh, all of the documents that were in that in that batch and use that to update your index. Uh, but if there's no updates to, you know, if the tag you care about or the family or the schema or the doc IDs you care about don't show up in the Bloom filter, then you know you don't need to bother spending all the effort to load the full Merkle tree and parse the whole thing. You could just skip this batch. Um, well, I guess I guess to add some more nuance. So it's not yes and no, really. It's it's yes, uh, it, well, it's no or maybe. Right. Uh, so the, the thing here is that the, the nodes of the leaves in the Merkle tree are sorted by family and then it's sorted by tags and then by schema. So uh, actually, okay, it looks like family no. then schema then controllers then, okay. Yeah, there's, no, there's no tag sorting. So if, if you're indexing by family, uh, you actually don't need to search the entire tree to like see if the, the maybe is actually yes. Then you can use do a binary search through the Merkle tree to find uh, the family of the ones updated. So in order to make stuff efficient to, to index, you would like first set a family and then like have um, a schema or controllers or like that you can like index by after. So like that allows you to do like more efficient like these binary searches through the tree rather than like having to look at all the entries. Yep, great point. So we're, we're, we're definitely prioritizing family as the primary indexing mechanism here. Um, we expect people to set families and use fam use the family property in the document metadata as a, as a primary tool signal to indexing services as to whether or not, you know, they want to index that document. I guess, I guess a nice way to use this is kind of like you set a, you set a family that's like generally for like your application, but then you might, might want to have like a subgraph that's only like certain types of comments. And then you can just tag those uh, things with, with like, oh, comments. And then you can create like a subgraph that only ha is for the comments um, or like stuff like that. So uh, you can be more granular, but like the, the most efficient thing is going to be to use the family. Cool. Any questions about this? Uh, I have one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so this is for like following updates on chain. Could you also like follow PubSub topics as well? Or, or is that like a different use case? Like, I guess, when would you do that versus following these anchor updates on chain? Yeah, you could follow PubSub. We haven't built you know any particular system to, to make that to make that easier in fact but some people have worked or there were some some hackathon apps that came out two weeks ago that actually were, were watching PubSub updates and building some indexes off of them so yes you absolutely can i think the challenge with PubSub is to build an indexing system is you don't get the the his, any historical data right like you, your index is only up to date from the moment you start listening uh and if a message is missed because you're offline for any reason, it's like hard to to get it back. Um, the using the chain as your indexing system is nice because you can replay. You know, as part of you know, you, 
uh, a sinking, you you basically replay the whole the whole state anyway. Um, so you can gotcha. you always have you have the history, so you can you can go back in history and find old old things to make sure that your index you know has has the full historical view. Um, but gotcha. I can even yeah. see potentially some hybrid solutions that like bootstrap off of chain on chain data and then use pub sub for for like the advantage of pub sub is that it's much more real time. The anchors on chain happen in periodic batches um, uh, with potentially quite a long delay. I, we haven't quite figured out exactly how long the, what our, our anchor frequency is gonna be on mainnet, but it, like for the anchor service that we run, it's probably gonna be order of like once a day, you know? Um, so uh, if you wanted more up-to-date real-time index, then you would want to use something like PubSub to get, to get faster up, updates into your index. And I guess also like a subgraph would be actually going out and reading documents from the ceramic network. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I guess I guess the the so we've been discussing this with the, the graph team and like the most nice thing you could have would be like a, a you know a subgraph that just gets the, the latest update of all of the documents that are of this family, right? But the thing that's probably we're gonna like get to first is a subgraph that just gives you all the document IDs of all the documents in that family. And then it will like, so, so that the, the only thing that the subgraph returns is just like a, a set of document IDs. And then, and then you would have to like sync those documents. So like, that's probably the first iteration of this. And then that can be kept like improving. Maybe that could like, ideally we would combine the, the on-chain indexing with like an off-chain indexer as well. So that becomes like easy to use without having to think about like exactly how, uh, wh where the data is coming from, but that's probably like further out. Gotcha, cool, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Cool, any other questions on this uh, indexing stuff? Merkle tree on chain? Metadata, Bloom filter stuff. Cool. Then I will stop sharing. And anything else on core protocol? I think those are the, I covered the main things we're working on right now. So back to you, Joel. Thanks. Yeah, I think that was most of, most of the stuff that's been going on. So uh, Cody, do you wanna start to chat about the peer list? stuff? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a little background. Uh, Grave and I are working on GeoWeb. Um, we do have a front end app that um, has been, I guess it's been like a month now, um, that's been using um, the community dev nodes um, from Dreambox Labs. And so the past week or so, we wanted to swap that out with our own node, um, mainly just to play around with making a ceramic node. And I think that's probably what we want to do in the medium term um, anyway. So we played with that. I got a node running and then wanted to try to get it added to the peer list. Um, so yeah, I opened up that PR. I think some folks have seen, um, but yeah, I was hoping we could just talk about that a little bit. Um, because as far as like connecting to a swarm and stuff, the only thing that I have done um, is connect. I haven't like connected the node to a, like a ceramic node that's running, so like a JS ceramic node that I have running, but I've just um, pinged and didn't done Swarm Connect on like a normal Go IPFS node, um, but I didn't actually try to connect it to another ceramic node. Um, so I'm not sure. I think Val was saying um, that they weren't able to get that connected. Um, so yeah, I was hoping we could just talk through that a little bit. Cool. Yeah, I guess. Um... So, so I, I don't know, like, but you, I, I assume you're running this on some server somewhere. Uh, yeah. And I guess the, the main thing that we want to make sure is that when me as a user on my like laptop or my computer just like starts the ceramic CLI, the node that I get from that list, like all of those, I can connect easily. Like if it's offline, like it, it wouldn't break anything, but it's just like, 
we don't want to add like a node that's um, not not possible to connect to. Uh, yeah, totally. So yeah, I, I think it's just like a matter of like making sure that that works. So uh, I think what Val suggested was that um, to to so at the ceramic seal I use this uh, package called that ceramic uh, IPFS daemon. Um, uh, and I think you can use this. I don't know exactly how the, the interface, like how you interact with that, but you can use that and try to, to use that to connect to uh, your node. I don't know, Spencer, maybe you know like more details about how you would do that. Yeah, you could install it. I mean, it's got a bin, it's got a bin file. You should just be able to just run it um, directly from the, from the CLI, um, from a terminal. And it, it basically starts a, a JS IPFS node with uh, DAG Jose support bundled in, um, which is the the IPLD codec that Ceramic depends on. Um, so yeah, if you're just like running a, a raw Go IPFS node, unfortunately, that probably won't work with Ceramic right now uh, because Go IPFS does not support the DAG Jose codec that we use pretty extensively within within Ceramic. Um, we are working to get that. I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess it's still like, if, if you can connect to it to your, uh, Ceramic node using Go IPFS, that's probably a good sign because you, you can pair with that node. So uh, that's a good indicator. But I think to be on the safe side, you want to make sure that it actually you can connect with like. So actually, uh, the the network setup you have with uh, the Go node, the Go IPFS node, is that um, that's just like locally on your machine, right? And yeah, yeah. And then the peer you have on um, on your server that's just like live somewhere and has like a port that's open. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then we, we do have DNS record pointing to it. Um, but yeah, I, I can, uh, yeah, I'll check out that, the JS IPFS daemon um, or the ceramic IPFS daemon and see if I can get that to connect. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe yeah. Spencer, you can also like try to connect to it so uh, we can see that it works and then let's just merge that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Val, Val tried already and, and was not successful. So um, once you- well, I'll, try, I'll try to reproduce it and troubleshoot it. Cool, yeah, if you just make a message on the on the, the ticket, I'm following that ticket, um, can, we can give an awesome. option. Yeah. Cool. All right, so, so this brings kind of brings us to, or like one thing you said brings us to the next topic. So um, it, it's good that you guys are like spinning up your node and like pinning your data on there uh, because the community nodes that we're running uh, will from time to time be reset. And I think we just made a, an announcement in, in Discord that's like, we haven't really reset it in a while. And now we are making like an upgrade that, um, will allow us to like test data persistence much better. Um, but, but that means that pin documents that are pinned right now on our community, like infrastructure nodes uh, will not be like persistent. Um, so if you have like, or if, if anyone here has like documents that are pinned only on our infrastructure node, it's probably a good idea to pin them on some other node as well, um, just to make sure that they're available. Uh, but that should be as simple as like I don't, like running a CLI and like you spin it on your local machine and then, or you just run a server where it's always available. But yeah, as long as it, the, the document is pinned somewhere, uh, then you should be fine. Um, all right, so let's see, uh, I guess, um, I have a small update on um, the 3AD did method um, that we have in Ceramic. So the 3AD did method is really kind of um, what we've been using since uh, 3Box. And uh, with Ceramic, we're making like a, an upgrade to that. And so, so as part of this, I've been writing a specification for for the like exact like the 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 implement how you would implement like a resolver for a 3AD did. So for those who are not familiar, uh, dids or decentralized identifiers are like a 
standard for um, that allows you essentially to go from like an abstract identifier to resolve a, a document that contains public keys. So it's kind of like a minimal bootstrapping mechanism for building trust in um, in, in uh, public key infrastructure. So uh, there, are, anyone can implement like a DID method, and so and we have created a spec for the three ID that method. And as you might have seen before, it has this dead column three uh, method name. And there's basically like two versions of 380s. Version zero is the versions that have been created in uh, a three box. So any user that has used three box will keep using the same dead as uh, their migrated to ceramic. And that's based on uh, an IPFS CAD. The V1 of 380 uses a ceramic document, which makes it kind of mutable. And we have like a thing that upgrades V0 to still keep the same identifier, but always, but also be like up, uh, updatable in the document. So this kind of gets converted into a ceramic document. So yeah, uh, there's are two kind of variants you can see of 380s. One is like a document ID, while another one is a CAD. Uh, right, so in a DAD, there's CRUD operations. So create, read, update, delete. Uh, to create one, uh, you basically, there's a few things to think about, but you basically create a ceramic document that has some public key material in it. Uh, so tile, doc type, and ceramic. I see that this is actually not right. This should probably say, say tile here. Uh, anyhow. Um, so yeah, the metadata is just like a did key. So did key is another DAE method that's used a public key. And a did key is kind of dumb. You can't like update it. You can't like revoke the key. You can't change the public key that you're using, but it's useful to do like uh, certain things. So here, for example, this we set the did key as the controller of the document. Uh, so this is the did that can update the 3 d document. And the nice thing then is that we can change that key in the future to refer to some other key uh, or some other key did. So we, we, we kind of use the, the dead key as like a controller here. Um, and yeah, and then we just have public keys. So these are uh, public key strings encoded using uh, multi-codec. Uh, so these keys here actually encode uh, the what type of key it is. So this, you can't really see it from from, from the, these random characters, but this is a SIGP256K1 public key. This is an uh, X25519 public key. So the SIGPK1 keys are used for signatures and signature verification. X25519 keys are used for encryption and key agreements. Um, so yeah, so this kind of allows to do both verify signatures and exchange keys for encryption. Um, and yeah, the, the, this is just like a structure, there's details on like how you structure the, the, the content of this. Um, then to read a um, 380 dead document is basically load the ceramic document. Uh, and then you take the content, which looks like this, and then you convert this content into the DAD document using this algorithm that's described here. Uh, it's a little bit verbose, but yeah, uh, basically you convert this document into like a DID spec compliant uh, dead document. And then, yeah, there's some additional kind of metadata that gets populated. And then to update, uh the 380 you, you essentially use like take this content that you put here into the 380 and just put new keys here in the content in the public key uh object and then you can also change the controller of this document and that's like how updating is done uh yeah and you can de deactivate the 380. um the cool thing about this is we specify since we specify the public keys with these multi codec uh formats. Uh, this means that we can, as time goes, there, there's better crypto, like maybe we need BLS for something. Uh, 
probably in the future we're going to upgrade the encryption to be uh, have like quantum secure um, key exchange uh, keys, which probably has like some different format or uh, def most definitely have a different format than these elliptic curve based uh, public keys. Uh, and then we can use since since this is like a, this multi coding table is, is extensible, we could use like upgrade um, the 380 to have like uh, post quantum security once that's available. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Um, we have some reference implementations, of course, that we've been using for a while. Uh, yeah, that's that's 380. Um, any questions on this? Is kind of very in depth technical. Uh, any questions on this at all? All right. Um, yeah, so maybe Graven, you suggested a topic. Do you want to chat about it? Yeah, these are probably just FYIs. There's not like tangible stuff, but figure I'll, I'll fill you in on kind of our roadmap and where we're going. Um, we are now kind of expanding um, the types of content that we're going to be linking and to, to finally include augmented reality content. So we're going to be doing some stuff, obviously, with ceramic new, new schemas uh, and doc types. Um, so I, I think that probably in the next couple of weeks, and then I'm working on a proposal for a Filecoin grant, um, kind of our longer term, um, Cody mentioned medium term, we're hosting a, a, our ceramic node, but we'd like to get the Filecoin um, storage of all of, our, all of our docs. So we're working on that. Not sure if, um, I, I guess I, I'm not um, up to date on kind of where you guys are at integration with Filecoin and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that'll be on our uh, hopefully Q2 roadmap and support some funding for it. Oops, <laughs> muted. Uh, so I guess for the Filecoin integration, th there is an integration that in general should work. That's part is like a pinning backend uh, to Ceramic. Uh, that right now though that will only work for cap 10 link doc types and the reason for that is that go ipfs still doesn't support the dag jose uh, so we're kind of stuck there waiting for the go ipfs team to make progress there um so before that it would be kind of hard to back up documents or like individual pieces uh to filecoin one thing that you could potentially build is a thing that just takes all the data of like a document, all, all the logs and like all the content of uh, each uh, commit, puts that into like one uh, big kind of uh, IPFS objects and backs that up. So that would allow you to have like less coarse grain kind of small pieces back up and that might be more efficient anyway that might be like the way to go anyway but that requires some modification to the power gate uh, pinning backend in ceramic but that's probably the way to go anyway i would assume because that means that you wouldn't need to like make a filecoin transaction for like every tiny piece uh, of the document so yeah it, that would that would probably be like something that well, you should sync, Sergey's not on this call, but you should sync with him because he's been building uh, that backup system um, and has been interacting with the, the Filecoin grant team as well. So yeah, you should catch up with him. And so you're saying the current limitation is, is that PowerGate is using Go IPFS and that's why they can't use the um, new codec, is that? Yeah, I think, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Like you can point PowerGate to a JavaScript uh, IPFS node, but I think, and that we, we like explore that path, but I think there was some issue there because like PowerGate itself is built in Go and was using the codec somehow. Mm, okay. uh, so there wasn't any like super easy fix for that. But I think regardless of that, like it might be more efficient to like take a, larger piece into as one object and store that in PowerPoint. Otherwise you'll have one deal for each commit in the in the document log. Okay. 
Um, yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Because yeah, we're, we're also going to have, if we, if we have AR content, like it'll probably be a ceramic doc um, referencing just a normal IPFS CID. And I assume we have to do something custom for those anyway, right? Like, um, I don't think ceramic would know, or like, yeah, ceramic pinning service wouldn't know how to traverse those. Is that right? Yeah, so that's like an, yeah. yeah that, that's an interesting point. And that's one thing we have been thinking about. Like, it seems like a very common use case. You just point, put like an IPFS CID in, in the document and you want that to be pinned on the IPFS node that like the ceramic node is running. So what, one thing we've been thinking there is like, they could build like a system that's like a hook that's just like maybe in the metadata of like, a, when you create a document to say like, you know, IPFS pinner. So it like looks through the documents for CADs and then pins either use the first thing it finds or like recursively pins uh, anything that's linked from the ceramic document. Um, so, but, but yeah, that's not, that's not something that's possible right now. Uh, but if you guys are interested in, in like integrating that into ceramic, uh, we could like collaborate on um, a CIP for that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, yeah. We'll, when we get there, we'll definitely reach out and figure out what to do. Um, I think that, yeah, that probably will be pretty soon. So probably before Filecoin stuff, actually, we'll be looking at that, so. And that's also kind of why we want to run our own nodes is, yeah, we want to end up somehow pinning that content as well. So yeah, we'll have to think about that more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, reach out when you get to it and see, let's see how we can solve it in the best awesome. way. Uh, cool. So let's see, I have, uh, did I have something more on my list? Hmm, I guess, Paul, so I guess there's two things uh, you could chat about. Like one is, um, <laughs> now my brain is empty. Right. One, one thing is the, that I think would be relevant is the uh, doc ID JSON schema stuff. Like how we can like, you know, compose schemas when you have documents that link each other. And yeah, the other thing, thanks Spencer, is the append collection CIP. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, um, yes, I start with uh, doc ID one. Uh, the other one is building on top of it. Um, okay, you should see my screen here. So um, uh, let's see. So yeah, it's CIP eighty two uh, that defines kind of um, specific metadata that can be added to JSON schema uh, in a way that hopefully ceramic or at least the tooling on top of it would um, get some more information about the uh, the intent of some some fields in the schema and how they they relate to ceramic itself uh, rather than JSON schema in general. Um, so the first idea for the, for this is to know if a string in a schema is actually referencing another doc ID uh, on ceramic. And so the way it's defined here is just having uh, this ceramic um, field uh, property on, on, a, on a string um, with a dedicated type of being a tile because uh, that's the the, the type of the ceramic document it's going to point to. Uh, and so from here, we can say that a node doc ID is, uh, is pointing to a tile. It's a string in the JSON schema, but if you try to load this uh, value using ceramic, uh, you, you, get, uh, you get a tile. And uh, part of it is also about the static discovery. 
and that would be here. Uh, so this would be an optional field, but setting up the schema. And that's where we can indicate that um, the doc ID here should point to a ceramic document having a specific schema. And so from there, what we have is that by loading these notes uh, schema that represent just a list of, of notes and having this uh, only access to the schema, we can detect um, other relations uh, to the relations to other schemas that are here, right? So, so from this list of notes, we can know what is a note detail schema by uh, loading it here. Um, so, so that's really the main idea here. Uh, so the CIP just defines the fact that it's reserving the type tile here on, on the ceramic metadata um, property and the schema that can be either a single string or an array of strings uh, in case the document could point to any, um, I mean, to, to one of different type of schemas. Uh, so that's the main, uh, the main goal here. And then the other, um, well, I guess, yeah. I guess, uh, oh. yeah, get back to yeah. It. So I guess on this one, like the, the thing that's really cool about this is that, um, like you could potentially, like, if you start like indexing, like these documents, like you wouldn't necessarily know like if there's a document linked from one of the documents you wouldn't know like okay what what how the data in there look like but if you can define like schemas like this in this recursive way you would actually be able to like say okay if there's a link to a document that it will have the schema and then you can like you know keep maybe you can make that like multiple layers recursion like you can have the schema you can you can know all of the schemas for for like a definition in IDX for example, without having to like look at each document, uh, which allows you to like uh, it, well you can make typing better, but you could also potentially like make GraphQL queries on top of this much more easily, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's really about giving static access rather than only dynamic one once a document is loaded. Uh, yes, metadata. But any any questions on this before we move on? Uh, well, did it make like does it make sense like why why this is relevant? Yeah, I guess another question is related to what we were just talking about. Would this be a piece not pointing to IPFS documents, but if you have a ceramic document? referencing another ceramic document and you wanted to like recursively pin, would this be used for that as well? Um, would you still need something like showing the links like somewhere else in metadata or would like somebody indexing be able to find all of the doc ID links like this? Hmm. No, I think I think actually like recursive pinning is a separate thing. That's just like if I have a document and if that links to a document, then yeah, I like pin the first thing and then find the other document and pin that as well. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's something that you could do with or without this, I guess. Uh, here is more like, you know, providing like a semantic description of the document and the document that's linked from the document and, and like, um, yeah, the whole kind of graph of documents. You can write like a semantic description of it. Mm -hmm. Because of the schema, I see. That's kind of the main purpose. Okay. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, you can you can always like link ceramic documents from other ceramic documents, and we have this feature called multi query, which allows you to like uh, sync multiple documents at once uh, that like documents that are linked to each other. So I don't know if you've had a look at that, but that's that's possible in the ceramic API. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, but yeah, pinning, recursive pinning is actually something that we haven't implemented yet. Uh, but that, that's a good idea. I think uh, we probably need to think about how that works because 
in IPFS, like you can use recursively pin stuff because it's just like uh, a DAG. Whereas in ceramic, you can actually have uh, cycles. So it needs to be more careful. Mm -hmm. there. Cool. All right. Any other question about this spec? Okay, I'll move on to the app and collection ones then. Um, so here the idea is to be able to store a possibly large number of uh, items in a chronological way um, in, in a document that would kind of be limited by the fact JSON schema supports arrays, but, but we probably don't want to have hundreds of items in a single array and in a single document, uh, because that would be slow to load and update and everything. Um, so instead, the idea is to split uh, this large collection into multiple slices of a given size and uh, providing kind of standard way of inserting and uh, looking up the, the items in, in this collection. Um, so the main uh, uh, way it works here is having one document that here is called the Appian collection that would be the entry point into uh, accessing this, this collection. Um, and then having individual collection slices that actually contain the data, the different items, uh, but with the maximum number of items each slice should contain. And the app and collection keeping track uh, of the total number of slices. And so because um, Ceramic allows to look at documents in a deterministic way, just by knowing the, um, the index of the slice and uh, the collection ID, we can look up directly what uh, whether a slice exists or has and has any contents. Uh, so this is what allows to, to rather simply um, having storing this kind of data. So we have the collection that just indicates what is the maximum number of items that a slice should contain and what is the current count of slices in the collection. And then in each slice, we just keep track of reference to the collection, knowing the index of the slice and then the actual content uh, that will be an array with the maximum number of items and uh, validating the schema of the actual items, uh, whatever shape we, we want to, to give them. And so, uh, from this, for, so it's really mostly about having a convention on how to handle these two uh, type of documents so that from there we can have a kind of standard algorithm about how we can uh, insert documents, uh, insert new items in the collection, and also how we can uh, load them. So from the beginning of the collection uh, or from the end of it, depending on whatever matters more in terms of like chronological order or reversed one. Um, so part of this uh, spec was created out of the activity streams collections and also the GraphQL connections. So it's really meant as um, having some sort of determinism in terms of uh, how the data can be iterated over, uh, notably how it's done for GraphQL collections to, to avoid like really um, having mutation from one app or one client or anything, uh, making changing expectation from uh, what another app or uh, client could be, could be doing to make sure basically the, the collections are stable uh, when, they are, when they are changed. So yeah, that's a gist of it. Any question?
So, well, I'm wondering, this is, I, I, I guess you talked about like, if this is like, especially, I can't remember like for sorted or unsorted uh, lists, or just like, this is best for? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's sorted, right? It's happened only. So you, you shouldn't, um, I don't know, like you're not gonna sort change the order of the items once once they are added if that's the question right okay yeah I, I guess i guess like my question is like okay so this is great for like you know anything that's just growing like i guess as i guess you have talked about like you know a twitter feed or something like that and yeah, i guess yeah. that makes sense to so also reference like activity pub uh uh or activity streams but but like how would you make could you make something similar that's just like a sorted list or like a you know that, that you kind of have to re uh, to sort like is is that possible to do like a similar type of structure like how would that look like I don't know that's really not in the scope of this one like yeah. the order here is only chronological right it's only the order of insertion so you can. Uh, start looking up the collection from the beginning in chronological order or from the end in reverse chronological order. Uh, but it's that's the only kind of ordering mechanisms you have. So the append collection, like the root document, does the, the, the main, is the main thing that that contains use like uh, a number or uh, does it also contain the document IDs of the collection slices? No, it doesn't need to. Uh, all it needs is to con contain the, the count of slices. So we can keep track of where we are, like when, when you want to append a new item, just knowing what is the last slice you should try to load and add the item to. Uh, but then because of determinism, if you know the index of a slice and the collection ID, you can simply looking it up. You can simply look it up. Yeah. That's, that's kind of cool because you, you can kind of just keep adding to this list without, you know. Yeah, that's a goal, right? You can match issues. Yeah, it's, it's it's like ideally you define the maximum size depending on the length of your items. Like let's say you want to have maybe blog posts or this kind of stuff and you want to limit one slice to, I don't know, 10 blog posts so it doesn't grow too much. Uh, or you can have, I don't know, maybe your slice only references doc IDs and, and you're gonna load these IDs uh, uh, in later and so you could have 100 items in, in your slice if you want, right? So it's like more like what you define uh, to, to start with, and then you can just add to your collection and you don't need to care about how much it's gonna grow uh, purely from, from your application perspective. Uh, it's gonna, the, the logic uh, implemented to, to support this would just create new slice as needed. Yeah. I guess I guess one thing that would be useful. I don't know, uh, and sorry for not like engaging more in the discussion on the CAP, but if like if I want to load the latest slice, I guess I would. That's right now that would not be possible with like a multi query because I would first need to load the append connection, get how many slices there are, and then load that end slice. Um, Maybe it makes sense to like have, I don't know, like the document ID of the most recent slice in the append collection root document or something like that. Because then you could make one multi query to find the latest slice directly. Yeah, yeah, you, you could. I mean, we that's what we had originally, but then it was kind of redundant just in terms of like, if you have the count, you can get the, the slice from there. Uh, but yeah, for multi queries, it's something that could be, could be interesting. 
Yeah, we hadn't, hadn't considered that that use case. That is a, an interesting point. You could have the, you could keep the first the first, a pointer to the first document and a pointer to the last, yeah. for to enable multi queries, um, pretty easily. There's still there's still some upper bound here as to how much is because like, every time you add a new slice, there's still an update to the root append collection, so. This you know it decreases the rate at which that single document gets updated by a significant margin, which is great. But there's still some up like eventually that append collection, the law. Once we have snapshotting for ceramic documents, then that problem would be solved. Um, the problem the append collection isn't the document isn't growing larger, but the log for the document is growing larger. Uh, so if we had some way to collapse the log, then we then this would really scale pretty much indefinitely, which would be pretty cool. All right. Yeah. Any any other questions from from anyone? I think we, we need to wrap up in like a minute. So if there's any quick question on, on this. Does it seem useful? Cool. Yeah, hopefully we'll have some tools for this uh, in the not too distant future uh, to make it kind of easy to use like make an append only list and don't have to care about all the details but yeah yeah that's a goal all right uh yeah i think that's it thanks everyone for joining uh and we'll see you next time thanks see you